All right, welcome back everybody to another Q&A. We're gonna talk about bro splits again. We're gonna talk about mobility and soft tissue work, uh, mobility and stretching work, and we are going to talk about body fat, what you should stay at in the off season. So stay tuned and you'll get my thoughts on that. All right, hi everybody, Q&A time once again, and I've got some questions. Um, one of the questions that came up was around measuring body fat. The person heard that I have kind of a, uh, a range I like to keep people in, and I do. I do like to keep people in a range. I feel like, you know, when I was growing up in bodybuilding, the emphasis was just power shove food, get as much food as you, you could get down and get your scale weight up as high as possible. And I do agree with that to a point. You do have to sometimes get uncomfortable and eat a little bit more food than you'd like to eat. That's part of why bodybuilding is hard. It makes you do something that's uncomfortable. But there also is a point where once you get to a certain level of body fat, you just continue to gain body fat. If you're gaining body fat and you're not gaining muscle, there is no benefit. You maybe have some leverage like in a squat or something like that because your belly's bigger, but there's no real benefit. And typically, the fatter you get, the worse your insulin sensitivity gets. So you actually make it harder to build muscle, all right? So not only is extra fat not productive at all, it actually makes it harder to build muscle. So with that in mind, I like to keep people in decent shape. Usually when people are in decent shape, their insulin sensitivity is, is not bad. And what I mean by insulin sensitivity, when your body can take sugar, glucose out of your blood and put it into muscle cells and, and do it well, that's called nutrient partitioning. Um, you tend to be a little bit leaner. And somebody who doesn't, that process doesn't work well, where their blood sugar stays up high and they don't, they don't drive nutrients into their muscle cells as well, typically they can, uh, typically they, they will get fatter. There are some exceptions. If you're taking a ton of growth hormone, for example, your blood sugar will be high and you'll still be lean because growth hormone is an incredibly powerful fat burner. But generally speaking, that's how it works. So I like to keep guys in the range of say eight to 12%. Um, I like to stay around 8%, but I do know I'm probably the minority that can do well at that low body fat. So I'm okay when guys get to 10 or 11 or 12%. What I'm looking for though is I'm looking for kind of an outline of your abs. There's no reason why you should ever have no abs and a giant belly. Um, and I, I furthermore, when I used to do that, in, in 2001, I got up to 260 and my stomach got really big, and man, I was squatting a lot, but I feel like that really hurt my physique. And also when I came down, I had put so much fat on, I had to do so much cardio, and I had to drive my carbs down so low that I ended up competing at the same weight I competed the year before. And I think the year before I looked even better. If you looked, and I actually placed higher, if you look up pictures of me from the 2000 USA versus the 2001 USA, you will probably say, oh yeah, he looks way better to 2000 USA. And I think for 2001, I just ate too much. I just let my body fat get too high. And I let it get to like 14%, but for me, that was a lot. And it was just really hard to come back from that. So I think in order to build muscle the best, in order, and then not, the other nice thing is, is when you come down, even if you don't compete, if you want to get lean for summer, the beach, whatever, if you don't have to do cardio hours and hours every single day and starve, then you're, you're going to keep more muscle. And the, the most frustrating thing with bodybuilding is if you spend time to build muscle and then you just burn it right off. Because it's hard to build muscle. So I like to say 8 to 12%. Um, every, some people can get higher and still look good when they come down, but that's my guideline. Um, the same thing applies to women. You know, I like to see a uh, fairly tight body. Um, but you know, you don't have to be ripped. You don't need to see striations. You want to see good round voluminous muscle. Um, you know, maybe something like 18% or something like that is a, is a good place. Maybe even 20, somewhere around there. But, um, just try to keep it in range. But really what I want you to take from this is I want you to understand that there's a certain point where gaining, you're gaining fat. You're not gaining muscle. And when you get to that point, you're doing nothing positive. Okay. Next one. 
Um, uh, I got a question on how to measure body fat. So, so there's no perfect way to measure body fat. There's DEXA scans, there's underwater, there's bod pods, there's skin fold calipers. Well, what I do personally is, and I used to be just psychotic about this. I actually just really enjoyed it. I live in Columbus, Ohio, so I would go to Ohio State University, and you can get underwater, bod pod, and skin folds all done there. I think it was something crazy, like 60 bucks, too. So when I was dieting, I would go down there and check my body fat. I really like water displacement. Um, I like underwater. And I do like skin folds as long as they're doing something like nine folds and not just three. And usually what I found was the skin folds in the underwater would be pretty close. The skin fold would be a little bit lower. Um, the leanest I ever got, I was 3.9% underwater. And they told me that was the lowest they'd ever measured ever at the university underwater. And I was like 3.5 or 3.6 on the calipers. I had no readings anywhere except on my kidneys and my scapula. Um, so I was, we'll just say rounded up and say 4%. And then I did the bod pod and it said I was 12%. I immediately lost all faith in the bod pod. And every single time I went back and did it, the bod pod would give me some crazy number. So I'm not a big fan of air displacement, bod pods. I don't like them. If you're a regular person, you don't really lift weights a lot and you're not real muscular, then the bod pod may be just fine. But I've talked to other people who compete, and they tend to have the same results that I had with the bod pod. So if you have the ability to go to a university or something and test it underwater, I like that. Um, and I do like skin folds as well. Now, here's the thing. Here's what's most important. What's most important is not at the number is 100% accurate. If you're, say, 5% and it says you're 6% or 4%, that's not a big deal. The big, well, here's what the big deal is. The big deal is just make sure you measure at the same time every time. So if you measure it one day and you do underwater and skin folds and then two weeks later, do the same thing. Don't do underwater one day, two weeks later skin folds, two weeks later bod pod. Just make sure you're using the same technique. That way you can see the trending because what you want to see is you want to see the fat number going down. As long as you see that, then you know you're trending the right way. DEXA scans are really good too, um, but they're not, they're not infallible either. Some people think they're infallible, but they're not either. Um, and if, but if you can get a DEXA scan, for example, um, they're, they're not easy to find around here actually. There's, there is one place that does it. Sometimes it's a little expensive down here. Um, I think it varies just by where you're at. I have some friends in Europe that they have access to DEXA scans and that's how they send their monthly updates, the ones who do monthly. So um, again, with a DEXA scan, as long, if you're going to use that, just make sure you use it every time. Uh, me personally, I love underwater and I love skin folds that are usually nine sites. Um, so that's what I would say to stick with. All right. And the third one I wanted to talk about today was bro splits. Without a doubt, uh, the most questions I get are revolve around bro splits, how to set up your training. And the common thought right now, I believe, in the natural community is uh, a little lower volume, a little more frequency. And I don't have a problem with that. Um, I actually like that. Uh, I like that a lot. I like push-pull legs a lot. But here's what I would say. I also have a ton of messages from naturals, and I've worked with a lot of naturals over the years who also did really well on bro splits. So what I want, what I want you to take from this is just because 80% of people say to train a certain way with your split, that may or may not be right for you. I would always experiment. If you're doing a bro split, which a bro split, that term means one body part a week, like your chest Monday, your legs Tuesday, your back Wednesday. If you're doing that and it's working, then I don't have a problem with it. Stick with it. If you're doing it and it's not working and you just keep doing it, and then I have an issue with that because you're doing the same thing over and over. Now, if you're doing a higher frequency split with lower volume, and if it's working, then great. Don't overthink it. Keep doing it. But if it's not working, hey, maybe you need a bro split. Maybe you do need more volume. I do run across naturals who recover really, really well, and they do need more volume. Um, so I think people are looking for the perfect split. 
and their only perfect split is the one that works for you. And here's the other thing you've got to consider. Like my split changes a lot. Sometimes I do really high frequency for one body part. Sometimes I'll just train one body part every, every five days. Sometimes I'll train it once a week. It's always changing. Like right now, I'm literally only doing every body part once a week. It just feels good to me right now. And if you've been watching my Instagram, I'm doing really good weight for me. I'm really strong. I'm doing 130 pound dumbbells for reps on chest. I'm doing hack squats with 600 pounds, rock bottom with rep for reps. I'm doing some really good stuff. And I'm training well. I'm not going to say I'm natural, but I am. I have been HRT for a year now. So I don't have the advantage of, you know, a high dose of gear. Um, but recovery is a little different. So when you're figuring out your split, guys, I just want you to remember there's no perfect split. Use what works for you. And then when it doesn't work anymore, change it to something else. Don't overthink it, okay? That's my advice for today. Feel free to ask some more questions below, some more Q&As. And we'll get them answered. Um, and I appreciate it. We're marching to 100,000 subscribers. So I really appreciate your support. Thank you. All right, bonus question. So stretching and mobility. Ah, you thought I missed that, didn't you? Um, so stretching. Here's my opinion on that. Hard stretching before you train. And there's a large body of scientific evidence that would say uh, it, it can weaken you. You won't produce, your, your peak power output will be reduced. So you won't be as strong as you could be if you stretch really hard before you train. I'm okay with some light stretching. There's nothing wrong with getting some blood in the muscle, but I do tend to agree that really hard stretching. Um, I, I used to do some really pretty hard stretching before I trained and honestly, I almost hurt myself several times doing that. But what I do like is really hard stretching after training. So let's say you train your quads, you're done training your quads, they're full of blood then I do like to do some really hard static stretching. Um, I do feel like that has some recovery benefit. There may be some other benefit as well. I'm not going to tell you that it'll cause hyperplasia and you'll have more muscle fibers. Some people think that. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But I do feel like the muscles definitely repair better, they recover better, and you just feel better. So I do like, um, and flexibility is a good thing. You don't want to be hyper flexible, but being flexible, and being able to move and move well is, is important to me. So I do think that the stretching helps with that. I have very, very flexible hamstrings, very flexible shoulders, but I work on it a lot. Um, and the other thing is uh, mobility work. So a lot of people ask me what my mobility routine consists of before I train. I don't, I'm not a big fan of mobility work unless it's doing something really special for you. And I, I, the reason why is I don't think it's bad, but I see people spend like 30 minutes on something before they even train. I, I guess if you have a ton of time in a day, you can do that. But I want to get in the gym. I want to hit a hard and I want to get out. I don't want to sit there for 30 minutes rolling on a lacrosse ball. Now, I did used to roll on a rumble roller and some of that stuff I do feel was beneficial. I felt like when I rolled on a rumble roller, like my upper thighs, for instance, my hip flexors, I thought that that was beneficial. But sometimes that stuff can actually cause more spasm. It actually um, works against you. So it doesn't work for everybody. What I would say is this. If you, don't, if you want to use a roller or lacrosse balls or things like that, you know, just find a way to be efficient with it. Don't sit there and use it for 30 or 40 minutes. Just find a, a quick routine you can do. I personally prefer to warm up by doing the exercise that I'm going to start with. If I'm going to start with uh, a dumbbell press, then I'm going to do dumbbell presses to warm up. Um, I like specificity. I like to get the muscles warm that are getting ready to do that exact movement. Um, so that's just my thought on that. I know there's some crazy detailed rolling routines and things like that. If you're injured or something like that and it's helping you, I'm not telling you to stop. You just asked me for my opinion, so that's my opinion. So. Thanks for watching.